Well, it's a great privilege after a few years of anticipating Stuart Allyott once again blessing us with his ministry here at the Bolton Conference. We finally now have him here, and it's a great privilege for those of us who remember in 2007 when he came and preached to us in this very pulpit and in this very room 15 years ago, but it doesn't seem quite that long. I should let you know, uh, and I perhaps I receive some indulgence in sharing this, that we often try to find a way to help our speakers find a topic or a theme, and we usually rely on works that are recently published by them, something that's in their wheelhouse. And so when we did so to Reverend Allyott, we received the curt reply that he could not oblige because he's an experiential Calvinist and he must preach the burden of his heart. And so we especially anticipate hearing the burden of his heart this evening as he comes to help us find that soul-refreshing glimpse of Jesus in his word. Brother Alia, thank you. First of all, let's open God's book in John chapter 20. The first verse, the gospel according to John chapter 20, the first verse. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and came to the tomb. So they, they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down into the tomb. <laughs> and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, 
Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things. To her. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? That's what uh, William Cooper wrote on our side of the Atlantic in the 18th century. So let's, let's cross the Atlantic and advance another century. Oh, Jesus, make thyself to me a living, bright, Reality, more present to face vision keen than any outward object seen, more near, more intimately nigh than even the sweetest earthly tie. That was written your side of the Atlantic, Charlotte Elliot, in the 19th century, they both understood that the whole Christian life consists of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There was a man once, you know, who came to Jerusalem and they said to one of the disciples, Sir, what did they say? We would see Jesus now, are you a boy here tonight? Or are you a girl here tonight? If you're a boy or a girl and you're sitting in the meeting and you say, you know what, I'd really like to see Jesus. I think you're probably a Christian boy or a Christian girl. But if you're thinking something else, you know, how long is this fellow who speaks so odd? going to be talking at the front you're not there yet but maybe you might be for the end of the evening how are we how how are we going to catch a sight of Jesus well we we catch a sight of Jesus with the eyes of faith as we open his book you know And when you open the book, what, what do you find? Well, you, you find there's a big table here and there's a, a smaller table here. And this is a fairly high table, but this is a much higher table. And, and on this table, there are 39 dishes. And on this table, there are 27 dishes. And, you know, they're all delicious. Uh, some of them, the pastry is a bit tough, but, but, but the flavor... Now, I like this dish over here. It's, it's, it's probably your favorite dish on this table. It's, it's quite a big dish. And do you know it's got 150 cakes on it? One of them is quite long, actually, and it's cut into 22 slices. Uh, do you know which, which book I'm talking about? Yeah, it's your favorite Old Testament book, isn't it? That's why Christopher's pe preaching on it. We all love the book of Psalms, don't we? 
and you can pick any cake there, and as you bring it to your mouth, music comes out of it. Isn't that amazing? And on this side, you, you've got 27 books. Wait, which one's your favorite? And you think, I don't know. Yeah, that one. And do you know why you love it? Because it begins like this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Help me out now. And the word was God. And then you read in the same page, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's a lovely book. We love it, don't we? And then we come to chapter 3 and we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then we read chapter 4, and it's about people who, if they drink this water that he gives, uh, they'll never thirst again. Uh, and we just go through this book, and we, we, we just love it. And we love all these dishes, but I don't know, we, we just seem to love this one. And then we come to I am, I am, I am, I am. And then we find the tears are dropping onto the page because he's been arrested. And he's being tried, but it's all unfair. And now he's being scourged. And now he's crucified. Will we never see him again? That's where we end at the end of chapter 19. Will we never see him again? That's why I'm preaching on the last two chapters. We see him again. We see him in a garden. That's what we're going to do this evening. We see him in a house. And I like that. I like how it all ends, don't you? We see him on a beach. We love John's gospel. It's good, isn't it, this Bolton conference, which isn't in Bolton. Uh, and... There's your favorite dish, and there's your favorite dish, and yeah, the only thing is that they've been served up on English china, but, but there we are. Just enjoy the meal anyway. We come to chapter 20 of John's Gospel, and we're in these first 18 verses, which I've just read, and these first 18 verses all take place on Sunday. I, I, I don't know. Do you ever have that sort of tickly feeling inside when you say Sunday? I, it's my favorite day of the week. I, I think I'd like to just say here, Sunday, 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 Sunday. I can't wait for Sunday. Can you? And here we see Sunday. And we see, what do we see? We see an empty tomb. And then we see Jesus. That's where we're going this evening. Marvellous, isn't it? An empty tomb and a living Lord. The empty tomb is verses 1 to 10. If you haven't got a Bible, there's one right in front of you. It's blue. It says Holy Bible, New International Version. That'll do for now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Verses 1 to 10. The empty tomb. Um. But please notice straight away what John doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us anything about the actual mechanics of the resurrection. And by the way, no, nor does anybody else. Christ's friends didn't see the resurrection, Christ's enemies didn't see the resurrection. Nobody saw the resurrection. But there was an empty tomb. And there are all sorts of other details which are, are, are not found in, in John's gospel. But this we know, 
that very early in the morning, verse 1, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Now the tomb was like a, a, a carved out cave in the rock. The entrance to it was quite low, so you couldn't look into the tomb without stooping down. If you'd gone into the tomb, you would find a shelf where the body would, of the person was to be laid. And when everything was done, a big, and I mean a big, stone was rolled over the entrance so that nobody could get out and nobody could get in. And she arrives there early in the morning, verse 1, and not only has the stone been rolled away, it's actually been taken away. Just And she doesn't stay to, to find out any more. She runs to fetch Simon Peter, verse 2 we're in now, and John. Uh, how, how far did you, you think she had to run? I've no idea. Have you? And we're not told. Uh, probably not very far. And then when she runs back, um, she, there's two fellows running ahead of her. And there, Simon, Peter, and John. Uh, can, we, can we just stop for a moment? When you read through the Gospels, when was the last time you saw Simon Peter? Denying the Lord. And the Lord looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered. And he went out and wept bitterly. What happened to Peter after that? John found him. And John is looking after Mary, Jesus' mother. And John found Peter. And when Mary Magdalene runs to find Peter... Uh, she finds Peter and John together. Isn't it wonderful? And there's this younger man running to the tomb, and there's this older man, this denier, running to the tomb. Well, the younger one outruns the, the older, and it, it's, it's so life, I, I, when I read this chapter, I feel I'm there, you know. Well, that's, that's the idea anyway, isn't it? And uh, the younger man gets to the tomb first. And can you imagine? There's, there's the entrance and there's the stone rolled away. <laughs> oh, it's a grave. And he's, we say in England, he's chicken. Do you understand that expression? He's scared. Um, you, you, you young men, how do you fancy going into a into a tomb when it's still dark and early in the morning and you're the only one there. You fancy that? I don't think I would have done. So, but he, he, he can look into the tomb and that's all he can do. And then Peter comes in and it's, it's Peter, isn't it? Well, you know Peter, whoo, he goes straight in. Here we are. We're in verses 6, 7, 8 and 9 now. Peter sees something. And John sees something. John didn't see it all to begin with because he didn't go in. Peter saw it all to begin with, but then John goes in and sees it. And verse 8, he saw and believed. Have you ever seen something like this? There's a family at home just doing normal things, but dad isn't home from work yet. And then there's a knock on the door, and there's the police. And they say, uh, Mrs. Henderson? She says, yes. I'm afraid we've got very bad news for you. And they tell her how her husband's been killed, killed that day at work. And now how is she? she? She's stunned. She's heard the news. She can't take it in. She doesn't quite know where she is. She's bewildered. She's disor disorientated. She's confused. Uh, it's, it's all in a muddle, and yet it's all very clear. And every, 
her whole nervous system's gone out of sync now. Now, I think something like that probably happened when Peter and John go into the tomb and they see what they see, which we'll come back to in a moment, and then the, it's, their minds are all in that sort of state, and as they go out, they completely ignore Mary Magdalene and say nothing to her and walk past her. So I think we better just look into it for a moment as to what actually was going on there. John wrote in Greek, not in English. This is what he says in Greek, verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and sees blepo, something registers on the retina, which registers in the brain. Verse 5, John, and he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet he did not go in, but in Greek, he stooping down and looking, and he stooping down and looking, sees the linen cloths, the linen strips. Blepo, something registers on the, red, on the retina and registers in the brain. Verse 6, Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he sees the linen cloths lying. Theorio. To look at something closely, to look at something carefully, to weigh it up, to evaluate it, to consider it, to try and get your head around it, to try and grasp it, to try and understand it, to try and see what's going on. That's, what he, that's the sort of seeing he had. Verse 8. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and says in, says in Greek, he saw. And that's Edo. To see with the eyes, to understand. To get it, to grasp it, and then a conviction is born inside him. He's now convinced of something he wasn't convinced of before. It will never leave him. It's a conviction. You see, there are different sorts of seeing, you see. So what did John see? Well, there's the linen cloths all around the body. That's standard. But they're undisturbed, of course. But there's nobody in the cocoon. So they've just collapsed. We've just got like an empty bandage. What's this bit about the handkerchief? Well... You see, they wound the linen strips around the body, right up to the neck, and they left the neck and the face unbandaged, and they just put something around the head. So when the body is gone, and the grave clothes haven't been undisturbed, this bandage bit around the head just goes boop, which is why the Greek says, twirled together. This is not resuscitation. This is resurrection. Get out of your head all thought that Jesus in his grave clothes begins to wriggle, begins to fidget, you know, like, like an escapologist. Did I say that right? Someone who does uh, escapes for a living. <laughs> anyway. Get that sort of idea out of your head. We're not talking like that. These grave clothes are undisturbed. And then the body's now gone, so that's all gone. And this bit's gone. Bang. Peter's looking at that. Say, Oreo. I'm glad this isn't on video. <laughs> oh, maybe it is. Uh, 
And uh, John looks at it. And he sees. Do you know why that stone was moved? Do you know why the stone was moved? Wasn't to let Jesus out, was it? It was to let John in. <laughs> and me too. And this book of signs, which John is writing about, and which he still mentions at the end of this chapter in verses 30 and 31, we've now come to the ultimate sign, the unique event which makes Christianity Christianity. The tomb is empty. The grave clothes are undisturbed. The Lord is not there. You don't have to invite me again. <laughs> but I think it's worth shouting about. Empty tomb. Right, now let's go to the second part. Verses 11 to 18. The empty tomb. The living Lord. And this section, the focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ, but the narrative gathers around Mary Magdalene. We see her alone. That's verse 11. We see her in conversation with two angels. That's verses 12 and 13. And then we see her meeting the risen Lord. And that's verses 14 to 18. Huh. Verse 11. Alone, but Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down into the tomb. And some versions say, and looked, but that's not there in the Greek language. She stooped down into the tomb. You see, John and Peter have run to the tomb. John got there first, but then Peter went in. And Mary hasn't, couldn't keep up with them. And they've gone into the tomb, and they're stunned by what they've seen. And they've come out of the tomb, and they've walked straight past her. It wasn't very courteous, was it? But you do funny things when your head's in a mess. Well, maybe you don't, but I do. I've been in a meeting where I didn't even recognize my own grandchildren. Shouldn't be confessing that to you, should I? Yeah. Yeah. What's Mary doing? Well, she's sobbing. This is uncontrollable, uncontrollable weeping. She's breaking her heart. She stoops into the tomb. It's a scene of utter distress. We've got a weeping woman who can't be comforted. And I can recall a weeping man who couldn't be comforted. That was me. My wife had been very ill and at last had to go into a nursing home. And then I was given the news that she would never come out. I would never sleep under the same roof ever again with her. Now, my name's Elliot. We don't have emotion. But I wept and wept and wept and wept. I don't, you couldn't have said anything to me at that moment. I, I couldn't be comforted. There's just no way to it. And I'm glad I had that experience, partly because I believe it's a proof of love, which it is here, and partly because I, I think it helps me understand verse 11. There's a woman weeping, 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 weeping. The Lord has done so much for her. She had seven demons before she met Jesus. Seven wicked personalities inside her personality ruling her. Jesus spoke a word, of course, and they went. <laughs> She's not going to forget that, is she? She's seen her Lord crucified. 
She's followed the cortege to the tomb and she stayed there as long as she could, even though he's dead. And now after the Sabbath break, she's come back at the very first opportunity. But now not even her Lord's body is there. She's got nothing left of him. She's lost him. She's alone. But then she's in conversation, verses 12 and 13, with two angels. She stoops into the tomb and she sees Theorio. She sees, oh, what does this mean? How can I get my head round this? What's happening now? What am I to make of this? That's where the body should be, but there's an angel sitting where the head should be, and there's an angel sitting where the feet should be, and they're asking her a question. Verse 13, woman, why are you weeping? And she gives them an answer. Now, if you've got your Bible open, look at verse 13, the end of the verse, but compare it with verse 2, the end of the verse. The end of the verse in verse 2. They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Verse 13. They have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. He's dead, you know. But in her mind, he's still her Lord. She can't forget what he did for her. She can't forget the years when she knew his love and saw the miracles and sat under his teaching. She can't forget it. And now he's dead and even his Body is precious to her, but it's gone. It's been taken. And I don't know by who. And I don't know what they've done with it. But let's end this session by looking at verses 14 to 18. She's bent over. She stooped down, she's seen the angels, but when you're looking for your Lord, you know, not even meeting angels is going to satisfy you. And besides, these angels haven't even told her anything about her Lord. They just asked her a question. So she pulls away from the tomb, stands up, turns round, turns her back on the angels, and sees Theorio, a man. What does this mean? What am I to make of this? Who is this now? What's going on now? But she doesn't know who he is. And he speaks. And he asks her the question, the very same question, the very same words as the angels have just asked. Woman, why are you weeping? And then he adds another question. Who are you seeking? Oh. It's one of the cemetery staff. Well, I'm in North America. It's one of the cemetery staff. Perhaps he can answer my question. So she puts it to him. And she says, you, you, if you've taken away the body, and you, 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 just, just tell me where it is and I'll, I'll handle it. I'll take it away. And that's what love does, you know. She's, put, she's incapable of taking away the dead body of a man. But she offers to do it anyway. Mary. Did you ever sing, he 
he speaks. And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody he gave to me within my heart is ringing. Mary. Just a couple of syllables from that voice. I would give everything in the bank, you know, just to meet my wife once more and just hear her say, Darling, that voice, there's something in a voice, isn't there? I think it's the most powerful word in the chapter. Mary. Rabboni. Not teacher. My teacher. I want you to imagine a family where one of the young men in the, in the family, grown up boy, has gone off to war. And they've had no news of him for a year. Where is he? What's happened to him? Is he wounded? Is he dead? Is he captured? Is he lost? And then the dog barks and the door opens and he walks in and the first person to see him is his sister. And she runs to him and throws her her arms around him, and she thinks, oh, it's wonderful, he's back, everything is going to be all right now, everything's going to be like it was before. Mary, they're not going to be like, things aren't going to be like they were before. Please stop clinging on to me like that. Mary, in future, it's not going to be a physical nearness. Very shortly, Mary, I'm going to ascend. So go and tell the others. Ascend? Where to? To my father and your father. My father, by eternal generation. Your father, by gracious adoption. That's why he didn't say our father. My father and your father. My God, because you see, there's the father and the son and the Holy Spirit, three who are God. The Father is God and he's all of God. The Son is God and he's all of God. The Holy Spirit is God and he's all of God. But the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. But there are not three gods. There's only one God. Can you get your head around that? But they're equally God. Each one of them is completely God. And yet in that equality, there is order. So the Father is first and the Son is second and the Spirit is third. But there is no senior and no junior. And so... Jesus has his father as his God. 
from all eternity. God is your God, if you're a Christian, from all eternity in the covenant made with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's God by right. Whereas we are made partakers of the divine nature by grace. So Jesus can't say to the disciples, go and tell our God. It has to be my father and your father, my God and your God. But go and tell them that in the future, fellowship with me is not going to be based on my physical presence that you can cling on to. Go and tell them that I'm ascending. So Mary went off and told the others and told them what? That he was risen? Yes. That she had seen him? Yes. That he had spoken to her? Yes. And that he was going to ascend. Ladies and gentlemen, he has. And that's where he is today. And that, by the way, is why there is such a thing as experiential religion. The gospel we believe, the Christianity we embrace, is believing the right things, we call it doctrine. Behaving in the right way, we call it ethics. And having personal dealings with God, which we call experience we rejoice in the empty grave we rejoice in the living Lord and we rejoice that whatever side of the Atlantic we live on we may live on Christ live near Christ know Christ and be close to Christ So we can pray, oh, Jesus, make thyself to me a living, bright reality. More present to faith's vision keen than any outward object seen. More near, more intimately nigh than even the sweetest earthly